Welcome back to the Loudmouth MMA Podcast. This is the MMA Takeover with Keith Schilling. I, of course, am the host, Keith Schilling. We have a lot to cover on this Friday. I apologize. I normally tape this on Thursday night, so those who woke up Friday morning and, and was looking for the podcast, I apologize. Uh, some personal things that I, I wasn't able to do it yesterday, uh, but it worked out even better because you know the weigh-ins went down. All the fights are official, and it's always it's always you know for the, for the UFC this weekend. It's always worrisome to talk about a fight, and then all of a sudden, you know, something happens at the weigh-in, someone misses weight or whatever, and a fight's canceled. And I just wasted time. So now I know it's official. We are a little over 24 hours from when UFC 247 goes down in Houston, Texas, with of course the the guy I believe is the goat, John Jones getting a very stiff toss in the undefeated Dominic Reyes. The other, the other big named bout or the fight that should get a lot of attention, obviously, Valentina Shevchenko, the UFC flyweight champion defending her belt against Caitlin Chikagian. Uh, before we get into the card, I just want to sit, let you guys know what's going to happen on this show. We're going to be in the three segments. In the third segment, I'm going to give all my predictions for what goes down at the Toyota Center in Houston. I'm going to give my picks on all 12. It's not going to be super detailed. Uh, I go very detailed in my prediction for John Jones and Dominic Reyes in the all angle show that I, that me and Jonathan Franklin do. If you're not familiar with that show, it is the entire show is dedicated to one fight, which is we do periodically when there's a big fight, usually in the UFC, we might do a Bellator one. If we feel, uh, you know, we feel it's, warrants the attention uh we did it for john jones dominic reyes we we call it all angles we, we cover the fight from all angles the first segment we talk about the backstory the second segment we break down one fighter third segment we break down the other fighter fourth segment we make our prediction and fifth segment we kind of pr- uh project what should happen after that we challenge people to ask us if we covered all angles and we didn't tweet at us and, and say uh, what we missed, but yeah, check out that show. And also why I won't go in super in depth on all, on all these fights. We also have the breakdown show uh, on this network with Max Freeman and Marcel Dolph. They do a fantastic job. They cover all 12 fights as I will, but I won't give as much detail as they do because, uh, you know, we have other stuff to talk about in the second segment. Um, I've been, t- I've been getting MMA medias to come on every week and talk about the fights and talk about, you know, the news and MMA. For, the, for this show's history, we're actually not going to go with a media member the first time as our guest. Our first guest that is not a, me, a media member is one of the best coaches in all of MMA, Safe Sayud of Fortis MMA. That team is blazing hot, and he's got a very, very busy Saturday as he'll be cornering three different fighters. He'll kick off the card with Austin Lingo making his UFC debut, facing uh, Yusef Salil, another guy making his debut, Miles Johns. The contender series stand out going against Mario Batista. And the last one, he'll be cornering Alex Moreno as he takes on UFC newcomer Kalen Chaos Williams. So he'll have, he'll have a busy weekend. We're going to talk about those three fights. We're going to talk about uh, just as, you know, what is he doing there at Fortis MA and why they're so hot. I'm looking forward to that. But before that, I want to talk about, you know, some of the pre-talk that's been going on. Dominic Reyes has been getting under the skin a little bit of John Jones. And one thing he said that has really sent the MMA world in a frenzy, maybe maybe finally taking some heat off of Stephen A. Smith, where it seems like Stephen A. Smith's comments about Donald Cerrone just would not die, you know, with getting the attention. Dominic Reyes said that basically the reason why he'll win is that John Jones has never faced an athlete like him or that he is the only athlete John Jones I face. Of course, John Jones laughed at about that as he's faced, uh, you know, who's who's list, especially in the light heavyweight division. He talked about, you know, Daniel Cormier going to the Olympics. You know, he faced him twice. He faced uh, Ovin St. Preux, who played D1 football, I believe, at University of Tennessee. You know, Leo Machida has been a high level karate. I don't know what the word is, karate practitioner his entire life. You know, the, he's faced these incredible athletes. Uh, so, you know, John Jones has let's talk about that to all the fans. And I think it's, I, I love that the fans, they've made this thing where every time we talk about Dominic Reyes, we put this like, 
it's it, it's taken on almost that autumn Adam Loboff goat joke thing where people make a joke about Adam Loboff being a goat and then he's, you know, like above, uh, you know, above everybody else and everything he's done is great. Kind of like those Chuck Norris jokes. Uh, people are doing that with Dominic Reyes as an athlete. You know, I saw one meme that's, that, you know, showed many of the top opponents in the John Jones has faced guys like Daniel Cormier and uh, Vitor Belfort or Machida, whoever. And, then they said, well, none of them have played. And then there was a picture of Dominic Reyes and it said, like, played baseball in high school or something. Uh, and, you know, and I saw one, somebody, John Jones tweeted about that when when uh, Jones was given all the accolades of, of the opponents that he has faced. And, and some, some fan tweeted out, but none of those guys played baseball. And, and Jones had a, had a laugh of that and saying, oh, yeah, you got me there. Um, so I don't know if, if Dominic Reyes is going to come out throwing sliders and, and – spitballs or what but I'm, I'm having i'm having a fun time watching that and it's okay to have a laugh at, at its expense i don't think this thing will go away it, it reminds me a little bit when uh kamaru uzman the, the ufc welterweight champion said he's only at 30 percent for his fight against uh, i don't remember who it was that he said that against but but you know fans would not let that go 30 percent uh kamaru uzman i think this athletic dominic reyes won't go away that said, I think we kind of misinterpret what he's saying. And what I think he's saying is like, not that I have accomplished the most, being that he f- played football at, uh, I think he played at like a D2 school, almost made the NFL and stuff like this. And this is something that John Jones pointed out, like, well, if you're such a good athlete, why don't you at least make a practice squad in the NFL? Or why don't you, you know, make it further in track and field or baseball, or basketball, whatever sports you played? I think what he is more saying is not that, you know, Daniel Carmen is a wrestler or Leo Machida is a karate guy and, and Vitor Belfort, you know, boxer, though obviously he has a Brazilian black belt, but, you know, he's known for his box. I think what he means by this is he's not known for one specific uh, background. What he's known for is that his, his crazy athletic ability and that he may be the first guy John Jones has ever faced that can either match John Jones's athleticism or perhaps it actually surpass Jones' athleticism, especially at this point in John Jones's career. At 32 years old, this is not the guy who was 22, 23, 24, 25, rising up through the UFC and wrecking. I think he was, what, 24 years old when he won the title? You know, we see a – you know, a little bit of a slower John Jones, a little bit uh, more methodical John Jones. He's not, you know, we don't see these, you know, suplex and Stefan Bonner type move in. Now, of course, he does spinning back kicks and he still does ungodly athletic moves. But he's more, he, he has a little bit more polish now than Sizzle. So uh, when we think of an athlete, what do we think about? There's some, there's some characteristics. So I came up with four characteristics. The first one is size and length. The second one is explosiveness. The third one is power and strength. And four is speed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to back up. I said explosiveness. The second one. I meant elusiveness. Elusiveness of the second one. Third, power and strength. And fourth, speed slash ex- explosiveness. So does, John, does Dominic Reyes check all those boxes? Does he have the proper size for the weight class? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, he's a tall, lengthy guy. Is he elusive? I mean, did you see the way his step back punches that that took out uh, Tashera? I'm sorry, not Tashera, to, um, OSP, the step back that he took out Chris Weidman? I mean, he he's elusive enough to get away the strikes and then spring back with his own. Does he have power? I mean, ask Chris Weidman if he has power. Pretty much the first punch that took Chris Weidman knocked him out now of course a lot of people say well Chris Weidman looks like a faded guy looks like a guy who has chin issues well I mean he basically knocked out all the way to St. Preux you know the last second he was left on the floor couldn't even could barely stand up after the punch uh it was a weird situation with time ran out he Jared Kinnear a guy that maybe next in line to challenge for the title and he knocked out first round um Joe Kim Christensen, the guy he knocked out in the very first round. Go back to his L- LFA days, the the highlight reel head kick knockout of Jordan Powell that got him that pretty much got him the attention to 
be brought into the UFC. So he he definitely checks the boxes when we talk about power and then speed and explosiveness. If you haven't seen Dominic Reyes strikes, he has he has very fast hands, very fast kicks. So he checks all the boxes. So I want to do this is saying when it comes to athleticism, and I think all those four things that we just said makes a great athlete. All those four characteristics make the athletic ability to succeed in MMA. Let's, I want to go through real quick before we go to coach, we take a break, coach Sayud. I want to go through the guys that John Jones has faced. I'm not going to go all the way back to his beginning of his career, but I want to start when he won the title. He fought Shogun. Of those four boxes, does he get all, all of them? I think Shogun lacks, he's always been undersized for the weight class, and he's not a long, rangy fighter. So he doesn't have the size strength. Next, next up, Quentin Jackson. I don't think Quentin Jackson's elusive. And I don't think he's really fast. He's more of a power guy. Act, you know, at that time was accurate. No, completely different guy now. But uh, Mishida, Mishida's undersized. He's never, he's not a long, lengthy guy. I mean, he fights at middleweight now. Rashad Evans, I think we'd all say he's not long and, and rangy. Uh, he was never a big power guy. I mean, we 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 all think about that that knockout of Chuck Liddell, but for the most part, Rashad Evans, and and and, and then the high kick of Sean Salmon. But for the most part, Rashad Evans was never known for his power. And, and of course, he ended his career fighting that middleweight. Uh, Vito Belfort, another guy middleweight at the end of his career, uh, extremely explosive, big power, even at light heavyweight, crazy, and one of the craziest speeds. Still to this day, one of the fastest hand speed, but obviously never the size straight. Chael Sonnen was his next opponent. I don't think Chael Sonnen checks any of them. Obviously, a guy who finished up his career at middleweight, doesn't have the size. He was never really <laughs> known for his elusiveness. Definitely not a power guy and, and not a very fast guy. Not a great athlete. A, a good wrestler. I don't know if Chael Sonnen was a great athlete. Alexander Gustafson, the only one that I think is, is power, um, even when he knocked out Glover Teixeira, it was an accumulation of punches. It was pu- beautiful technique, and but I don't think he had power. Uh, Glover Teixeira, I wouldn't say he's the most elusive guy. Uh, good size, good, definitely good strength, um, though that's kind of faded now as he's gotten older. But at that time, good strength, good hand speed, uh, but not elusive. Daniel Cormier, one of you know the greatest fighters of all time. But even though Daniel Cormier is finishing his career at heavyweight, he was still probably an undersized light heavyweight. I mean, at least in the sense of length, he was a shorter guy. That he, he couldn't match the length of John Jones. Um, OSP is, believe it or not, of the four guys that I struggle, I mean, of, of the four categories, OSP might be the guy, the hardest one to find, which one he doesn't check. But then I think about this. Uh, I, I, I checked it at elusiveness. I don't know if he's that great elusive in, or even that, you know, he has some good knockouts, but for the most part, he's not a huge power, you know, one punch guy. But is he great at any of those? Like you could say the, all the things about some of these other guys, like Daniel Cormier, say we want, he's very fast at light heavyweight. He's great in that category. I don't know if OSP is great in those categories. Um, Anthony Smith, uh, you know, middleweight, he's got the length, but I don't know if he has the pure muscle of being a, being a heavy, uh, a light heavyweight. And of course this guy's never in his career been known for his power. And then his last opponent is, Tiago Santos. Now, of course, I'm not going to go over Cormier and go over Gustafson twi- uh, twice as he faced those guys twice. So that's why I skipped. Uh, I didn't talk about the second time he fought times. But uh, Tiago Santos, another guy at, uh, you know, moving up to light heavyweight. I don't know if he lacks in size and strength, but I actually think he's not that very elusive. Um, he's very hittable. You know, he makes up for it with his in- ungodly power and a very, very fast, explosive guy who shortens the distance in a, a very good time. But I don't know if he's that elusive and, and the length. So that's why I don't hate Dominic Reyes' uh, argument that he's the best athlete. I think he could have worded it better. I think he could have explained it better. But that said, uh, I, I kind of agree with what he's saying. And these people who I saw people look at the betting lines and say, you know, that John, let me pull up the betting lines real quick. I should have, I should have teed this up already. That John Jones should be a bigger favorite right now. According to five dimes, John Jones is a negative 440 favorite. 
while Don DeGrays is a plus 390 underdog. For those who don't really understand the betting, because I understand a lot of people don't bet, what that means, which says John Jones is negative 440, that means to win $100, you have to put up 440. So the more amount you put up, obviously, the more you win. So for every $100 you want to win, you have to put up $440. That's what you have to gamble. On the flip side, when it says plus 390, that means for every $100 you put up, you will win $390. Now, of course, you put up $60. I'm not a mathematician, but you put up $60, that'll change. Instead of paying $390, it'll pay probably $275 or $2, I don't know. What, I, I'm probably way off the math, but you get the point. So a lot of people are saying that those lines should – are wrong. The Jones should be a bigger favorite. No one's give. Not many people are giving Dominic Reyes. I'm saying the opposite. I actually think that line should be a lot closer. I think that Reyes shouldn't be this massive underdog. Uh, Jones is showing signs of declining. I mean, his last two fights, he won by decision. Tiago Santos on one leg won a scorecard in one of the judges' minds. Uh, one of the judges' scorecards, I should say. So this is the first time anybody has ever won a scorecard who's one judge believes that Santos won. So Reyes might be in the right position. And at 30 years old, he's still making huge leaps and bounds uh, improvements. So I'm going to give my predictions at the end. I just wanted to point out that while I think it's funny, all these things that are being said about Reyes, I, I, I definitely uh, I understand what he's saying. And I actually agree with him. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to be right back with one of the very best Coaches in all MMA, Safe Sayu to Fortis MMA, please stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the MMA Takeover with Keith Schillen. I am, of course, Keith Schillen. We were just talking about UFC 247, the main event, John Jones defending his light heavyweight title against Dominic Reyes. We talked about how exciting that is. And there's a lot of hyperbole that goes around when we, when we talk about fighters, this and that. And one thing I always like to say is I don't like to use hyperbole. If I'm interviewing a fighter and I don't think this guy is a championship caliber fighter, I don't say that. I don't say, you know, future champion content. I don't do that because the people who listen to my show, I want them to believe what I say. I don't want to seem like a fanboy than that. That <laughs> what I'm going to say right now is not hyperbole. Our guest is one of the best coaches in all of MMA. He coaches one of the biggest uh, and best teams in all of MMA. They are red hot. He has an extremely busy week this Saturday as he's coaching not one, not two, but three different fighters. Ladies and gentlemen, the head coach of Fortis MMA, Coach Safe Sayud. Coach, how you doing, man? Good, Keith. How you doing? I'm doing excellent. So, so let's go to we we talked a little bit off air. We, you said that I'm a big supporter of it. I am a big supporter of. I, I can't say I'm a fan because I'm a media member, so I can't say I'm a fan, but I'm a believer. I'm saying like everything you touch right now, Coach, is is, is turned to go. So I want to ask you this question, and I know what your answer is going to be because I've seen it. In the- <laughs> I'm going to ask you why is your team been so great right now, and your answer is going to be, oh, we work really hard. Coach, don't yeah. give the cliche answer. Tell me the secret of why Fortis MMA is absolutely booming right now. What is the what is the secret? And I promise you, I'll make sure none of the other coaches are listening. <laughs> you know, you got that Boston accent. I know you're from the East Coast. I think yeah. you're probably a Patriots fan, so you know all about culture and okay. hard work, right? And that's really what it is. I mean, you answered it. It's a consistent effort that you're finally seeing all kind of come to fruition at once it's almost like one of those memes you know where they show under the water and they show all the failures and then they show the top that's what everybody sees right is is the end result so these guys these kids have been grinding for so long i mean we've just been working at this together for so long and it's all just kind of hit here in these last few years and and you know the most important thing is now with the success is maintaining that same work actually working even harder and understanding sure. what needs to happen to continue to be that successful and, and to continue to be even more successful than we are right now. Yeah, I uh, not that I would ever compare my coaching to you, but I used to coach wrestling at a much uh, lower level. Hey, but, that uh, matters. It all but, it's all the same. Uh, I, I kid a heavier we had. He was he's one of my favorite kids. He took second uh, in sorry, I'm sorry, he took fourth in the state 
and heavyweight. And he came and everyone who was above him graduated. So he thought he was the guy. And he te- and, and the reason why I loved him so much is he worked so hard. And then he kind of slacked off. And then when I talked to him after he got eliminated, he didn't even place his senior year. This is a guy that came in as the number one guy, didn't even place. Yeah, 100%. And he kind of said, yeah, you're right. I should have worked harder. And I said, Hebert, man, you worked this hard to take fourth. Why would you think you'd have to work less than that to get first? first. If anything – you're going to have to work harder. Exactly. Yeah, so I, I totally understand what you're saying, that guys are working hard. Now, I just want to, I just want to pause a second, and I, I'm going to need you to help me out, Coach. I'm going to start naming. These, these are the guys, if you're not familiar with, with Coach, if you're not familiar with, with Fortis MMA, you're not listening to the recap show that I do with John Franklin. As, as we have this little game, we, we got, have like our, our recap bingo, things that we say a lot. If John Franklin mentions anything Chael Sonnen says, it's like, okay, recap bingo, place it. And if I mention Fortis MMA – that's like, okay, recap, bingo, you know. I like it. I like it. So I just want to name some of So obviously this weekend he has Alex Morano fighting. He's got Miles Johns fighting. He's got uh, Austin Lugo, the brand, brand new, first making his debut. Some of the right. other fighters, uh, Jeff Neal, um, Mason Diego, Chasson. Diego uh, oh, Carlos Diego Ferrer, who yeah. just won last pay-per-view. Big, big win over former champion Anthony Pettis. Ryan Spahn, uh, Steve Peterson. Uh, who am I forgetting, Coach? I know, I know they go. Uh, you got Alonzo Menafield, who I Alonzo think Menafield. is Alonzo Menafield. Alonzo Menafield. Now we've got Uriah Hall as well. Right. He's also ranked tenth. I mean, we've got four or five fighters now that are in the top, you know, ten and twelve in, in their division. So, you know, that's what we're working for. We're working for rankings and to get in the top five and then then title shots and and that's the goal and that's what all these kids are pushing for and. Uh, there's a lot more of them, but I think you named off enough. Yeah. So, Coach, one thing that's been talked about Fortis MMA is, is basically you're not just having guys reach the UFC. You guys are winning, and you got this culture of winning. I think – what was the record? Uh, you have this insane record right now. So what, I, what, what is it, Coach? The record uh, in the last two years is 36 wins and nine losses in the UFC. Last year, we went 19-5, and five, and the year before that, we went 16-4. and four. And then uh, we, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's great. You know, I mean, I'm a big football guy. So for me, uh, you know, records are important and, you know, we don't have playoffs, but I'm high on win percentage too. I think it matters. You know, I mean, uh, I hate to lose. I mean, it's something that I hate more than anything. And I think that, you know, numbers matter, man, the score counts. And, you know, uh, that's just the way that we are. And we talk about it a lot in the gym and, I think, you know, the more people that win, the more the expectation is to win. And uh, those guys are carrying it and getting the job done. So uh, uh, one thing that I've noticed about your team recently is you've always had these uh, like homegrown guys, which I'm sure you, you coach and the team take a lot of pride and start from the beginning working yeah. them. But what I've noticed late, recently is you got guys who have been established. They start noticing your team and they want to be a part of it. How proud are you are to say – that you attracted a guy like your eye hall that he sees you guys and he wants to go train with you guys. Yeah. I mean, I'm proud of it, but you know, to be honest, I'm more proud of the guys that we built. And, uh, the reality is, you know, Uriah has been a great student. He's done whatever I've asked him to do whenever I've asked him to do it. And that's why he's fit. I've had multiple veterans come to us and, you know, Hey, I want to come train. And, you know, I think I'll be out there Wednesday. And I'm like, Hey man, like it doesn't work like that. Like if you, if you want to come train at the gym, for, we're not even taking anybody anymore. But uh, if you want to come train and be a part of the team, you're going to do whatever the team does. Like, I don't care what you've done. Nobody cares. I mean, uh, you, MMA is such a volatile, fickle sport. I mean, if you lose one fight, no one cares about you literally overnight. I mean, yeah. it's the truth, man. Uh, yeah, sure. You know, you get uh, you could have a champion. I mean, look at Anderson Silva. I mean, we used to talk about Anderson Silva like he was the best thing ever, you know. And yeah. now it's, uh, he was a cheater and he was a roid guy. George St. Pierre, who I think is – the greatest, uh, you know, him and John are, are like unbelievable. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can't, I mean, just, just stop, you know, with the arguments. Argue and, between uh, lobster and steak. Like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. just like, why, why do you, why do you got to tear down the grates? I mean, we get it the off, off the, you know, sure. But anyway, George St. Pierre, he came back, he beats Michael Bisbing, which is unbelievable. Sure. It was calculated, but yeah. I mean, Bisbing was beating everybody. I mean, you got to get Bisbing as well too. Bisbing had a great run there at the end. I mean, Legit champ, knocked out Rockhold, you know, was threw down with Henderson, you know, I mean, you know, he did his thing. 
And he came back and beat him. And instead of people adding to his legacy, they took away from it. Yeah. They were like, man, George, look at him running away. He doesn't want to fight Yoel Romero. He sucks. Yeah. He's the worst. And I was like, oh, my God. He was scared God. of Robert Whitaker. He's scared of Robert Whitaker. It's like this dude came back. He's my age. right? I'm 39. He came back, puts together a camp, he tore his ACL before, you know, and he fights and he wins. You know, and, and man, it's just like you can never, ever do enough. So yeah. just shut up and win, dude. Just shut up and win and keep on winning and just smash people. And that's really, you know. That's the environment that, that, that we preach, and this is a very short-lived business. So the guys that I take from zero all the way to the top, I'm real proud of. And you know, each fight adds another chapter and layer to the story. But, man, I'm proud of my homegrown guys more than I'm proud of anything, which is you know, 90, 95% of the team. So let's, so let's talk about this. This year, a big debate came down, who, you know, t- closing up 2019, is who's the coach of the year? The two guys that kind of jumped out, Coach Eric Albatacine of – Fight Ready, and then Coach Eugene Berriman of City Kickboxing. They both had, yeah. you know, UFC champions, sure. and, sure, and, sure. and uh, Coach Albatacine had the two weight champions with with Cejudo and Pitbull uh, in Bellator. But the name that some websites threw in, so like they would be voting, you know, it'd be like this guy, this guy, and then you. Not all the websites, not Ariel Hawani. Sure. Either. Uh, no, Ar- Errol had me in the category. It was me, after, Eric, and, and I think he, I thought he put you in after. No, no, that was last oh, okay. year. No, it was oh, that was last me. year. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. You're right. You're right. I, I apologize. It, it, it was just me, Eric, and, and Eugene. Yes. Yeah. yeah, sorry. That was last year when the, when your team was like, what the heck? Look at the run we're on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the fact that, you know, yeah, I know you're that guy that you, you, you're a very humble guy. You, you, all your interviews, you, you throw it back to your team. But – is, is this the year that you're the undisputed winner, Coach of the Year? I mean, you, you know, it all comes down to the kids, right? And, and again, it's like you don't ever see – could you imagine Bill Belichick being like, you know what, I really hope I win Coach of the Year this year. Like, yeah, yeah. you're the coach, man. I'm the general. I'm the leader. Like, yeah, yeah. hey, I want my kids to dominate. I want them to smash. I want them to win. I want them to win the belts. And I want them to do their thing and, and you know, and – uh make money, save money and live a great life. And if they do what they're supposed to do and what they keep doing, hopefully that ends up happening. You know, I always tell them I'm waiting for you to make it big. So that way I can, you know, I can ride your coattails. I tell them that all the time, but man, I'm the head coach, you know, I don't even talk about stuff like that. Right. Because it's, it's, look, I really appreciate it. I I see the recognition and I appreciate and and love the people giving love. You know, you got to, when people talk about your work and, and say, hey, man, this guy's doing great work, no matter what you do, if you were a janitor and they're like, look at those damn floors, like this guy's unbelievable. That's awesome. You know, and, you know, hey, if someone told you, man, you're such a good wrestling coach, Keith, like you changed so many lives, like it's going to affect you and make you very happy, yeah. you know. So I definitely uh, uh, really love the recognition and I got my OG media guys out there, you know, that that are riding with me and I love that. But. And it comes down to my guys, man. You know, I think that when you're out there campaigning for it, there's just something kind of whack about that, man. You know, I mean, it, it, it's just when you get to be a coach, it's just not about you anymore. And, sure. you know, I don't know. Maybe it's because I fought and and I remember, you know, wanting the attention and and it being about me and look at me. Yeah. I'm, such, I'm the man. But those days are gone, you know, and I just yeah. at 39, I don't even think I can muster that kind of <laughs> that, that kind of campaign. So I'll leave it up to you guys to to count yeah. the numbers up well i was i was out there arguing for you so i know i saw that my man so you mentioned bill belichick now obviously you mentioned i'm from new england uh obviously bill belichick we think is the uh we i think the saying in new england is the best coach besides coach say Sayud. i think that's what we all say in new england that's how yeah, we he say. is he's the best football coach ever <laughs> yeah. hands down bar none 100 percent. so um one thing I've, I've been impressed with Bill Belichick, I saw an interview once and they asked him how he's been successful. And he did. He honestly said pretty much the same thing you said, like yeah. back to them, staying humble, focusing on them. I have had great Process. Play, it's that. But he also talked about improving as a coach. Like I yeah. can't just make them improve. I have to prove. So sure. let's ask you, what areas do you think that you need to improve as a coach? No, that's a great question. And I mean, you know, every single fight, every single camp you're looking at, you know, the different modes and, and training methods that you're utilizing for your athletes. And, you know, uh, one big thing that you got to talk about is, are your guys getting hurt? 
Are they staying healthy through camp? Are they taking, you know, I'm a big, big guy on, on brain damage. I mean, any type of head trauma, like I just don't do that. I mean, I'll call rounds right in the middle. Nope. You're done. And you know, Oh man, let me go. Nope. You're done. I mean, I won't even let guys take really hard shots in practice a lot of times. And, uh, you know, I've heard it all. Oh, well, they're not going to be able to fight. Blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah. Take a look at the record, you know? Yeah. So, uh, these are, this is martial arts. So I believe in control. So my number one thing is the fighter's safety and their health and the longevity. If the guy's hurt, he's not going to be able to, you know, compete and he's not going to be able to win. Second, you know, how efficiently and effective can you win? And you look at a guy like Jeff. Jeff is the, probably the quietest, sweetest guy there is, Jeff Neal. Okay. He's okay. an absolute savage, Jeff Neal. Killer. Neal absolute right? killer. And I told him every fight, hey, Jeff, you're going to have to destroy people for your name to get circulated because you're just sure. a quiet guy. you know. Yeah. Uh, um, and sure enough, he's done that. And the thing I'm really proud of is yeah. you know, all these plans that we've been – game plans we've been coming up with have worked you know with jeff we planned uh we planned the camacho head kick we planned the body kick to get perry and then go upstairs it yeah. worked with, with diego ferrer we planned that short choke exactly like that i mean if you watch yeah. a ufc countdown we're doing the exact same thing we did in the fight and yeah. they even they even asked me they're like do you want us to not show this they're like this is kind of your plan and i was like it's exactly my plan go ahead and show it you know uh good luck so, stopping it yeah, good luck stopping it. Like it's not like their camp. They get, you know, I got a good camp. It's not like they don't know what we're doing. So, uh, watching your guys execute the exact game plans that you plan out in these huge big fights. I mean, and, and then easily too is really that really has made me very happy. And I think that's another level, right? If you can execute against any Anthony Pettis's of the world, never sure. been submitted, and Diego took him out, you know. So Jeff to Perry, never been finished. Uh, like mm-hmm. that, Jeff took him out in 90 seconds. So yeah. that's that's kind of where we're at now is is trying to take out all these tough tough you know athletes that that have been in the UFC for a long time and it's not easy but the kids are doing well they're doing real well. When you you mentioned game plans, you have you know this game plan for this fighter. You said Jeff Neal. You said body kick, body kick, go up to the head. Diego get the takedown, work for the submission. How deep do you go with those game plans? Like, all right, this is game plan one, but hey, this is Anthony Pettis. He's a really good fighter. This yeah. might not work. No, hundred percent. If that's not working, oh. we go to two. We go to three. Like, we, how many go, game plans do you have? We go real, real deep. You know, I mean, uh, this thing about oh, I don't watch tape, or I'm just gonna show up. Like, what the hell? What I'm a just gonna dumb, focus on myself. What a stupid thing to say. Why would you go into a war and not look at your enemy's yeah. strengths and weaknesses? Why would you not try to strategize on? Yeah. on you know the exact points of, of reference and study all the film and all the information and uh you know it's just an arrogant attitude you know i mean whatever it takes right whatever it takes to win so we study every little idiosyncrasy of, of our opponents and every single thing that they do and no i think we lost them for a second hopefully we get them back um oh i think i have they got the sunglasses on are they oh he's back are they you we, know, we lost we, you for we lost you for about three seconds can you hear me yeah i can hear you sorry we just lost you for a couple of seconds uh i look at everything and um i study everything and uh and we use as much information as we can and uh and it's worked out pretty well have you ever looked at and i know you you know, you got you practically have fighters fighting every weekend, but um, sometimes you get a, a week off where you might have you ever sit back on the couch and and watch a fight and then study <laughs> like actually study the other coaches. Oh yeah. And, and uh, all right, I mean, is, there, is there any coaches that jump out to you? You're like I've learned I, from this guy and, and I, that guy. I don't really study other coaches uh, now. I think really more than anything, um, I look at the trends of the sport through the athletes. So like, you know, the biggest thing that, that I'm seeing now is this sport is becoming so explosive. I mean, you know, you've been watching MMA for a long time. I mean, 2007, 2008, you'd watch a whole fight take place on the ground and it'd just be one of those fights, you know, where you'd be like, all right, this fight's going down on the ground. You know, let me just stretch out here on the couch. Oh, oh he's got a Kimura. No, no. Oh, yeah. sorry. oh, he passed. All right. Right. And that happened, you know, 20, 30, 40% of the time, whatever. Now, if that happens, you are so like, oh, my even me. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so bored. You know, yeah, the, the game is now stand up and box, you know, stuff to take down, explosive, dynamic scrambles, uh, forward yeah. pressure. I mean, it's you got killers out there, like kids like Dan Ige come to mind, you know, just a silent little assassin. This kid, yeah. you know, 
coming forward and just smashing people. Uh, great hands, but also a black belt in jujitsu, but never on the ground that much, you know? Yeah. So I, I think it's, for me, it's studying where the sport is and, and kind of where the athletes are, because that's who I need to worry about. I need to worry about the athletes. I don't need yeah. to worry about what the other coaches are doing. Uh, I'm worried about who we got to fight and what they bring to the table. So I'd say that's, that's what I spend a lot of time doing. Do you remember? And, and it's so, such a funny point what you said about how, how much is changing. You have to keep, you have to stay with uh, it or, yeah. or, or not even keep up with trend you want to lead the trend you want to be ahead right. of that of um, course absolutely remember the days you remember the days where a wrestler the game plan was wrestlers to get on top and press him near the cage that, that was, was like the key. and it's now funny. it's the opposite it's now so it's, funny now the guys want to work to the cage and they and they wall walk off but before people didn't know how to wall walk i, I it, remember i remember and literally you know hey man say just take him down get him against the fence and yeah. i've got a fight i don't know which one i don't remember but uh you know i only had six total fights three amateur three pro i I, I'm, I can sit out there somewhere, but I took the guy down and I remember underhooking him and scooting him over to the fence, yeah. you know, and then stuffing his head against the cage. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I got you now. I started elbowing him, you know, and now, you know, you wouldn't want to do that. And I actually it's a great point that you just brought up because I bring it. I say it all the time in the gym. I said, guys, when I used to fight, we used to try to get guys to the fence right. and yeah. smash them up against the cage. I said, now that's, you, you know, you're trying to get to the cage. So. You nailed it, man. I mean, the sport's changing. And if you as a coach don't realize the change in those trends because you're too lazy, you know, hanging out and, and doing whatever you're doing, then you got a problem. So, you know, my daughter's always tell me, what are you doing, dad? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm doing homework. You know, when yeah. I'm watching the fights. I tell him I'm doing homework. I said, this is daddy's job. You know, I got to, I got to pay attention and I got to see what's going on. So no, I, you nailed it right there. Yeah, I remember guys like Tito Ortiz, Mark Coleman, Matt oh, Hughes. Yeah. They made a living out of it. Guys not being yeah. able to wall walk up. Uh, so let's talk about the athletes. You got three going this week. Uh, Alex Marano, a guy who we've seen in the UFC, a lot of fights, veteran. Miles Johns, he's he's he's. I, I'm I'm gonna pause on Miles Johns for a second because I'm gonna give my contender series a story about Miles Johns. And then uh, Austin Lingo, a guy that kind of got thrown in last minute, but a guy that uh, you're really big. Let's start with Austin. One, how do you feel about the matchup, and how do you feel? And obviously, you're going to talk highly of your fighter, but uh, I mean, you said he's ready for the UFC. Like, what about him stands out to you that says he's a UFC ready fighter? Well, the thing about Austin Lingo is he's been fighting since he was about 14 years old, and and I don't think people know this, but he was on the national U.S. Muay Thai team, and he went to Thailand. He's been all over the world, Russia. He's been all over the place. He's got like a hundred fights, yeah. and Austin I Lingo. I didn't even know that. Austin Lingo actually lived with Donald Cerrone when he was 15, 16 years old for like months and months and trained at the BMF ranch. He was the number one um, amateur in, in the United States. He was kind of famous even. He was like yeah. everybody knew who he was. And then, he, you know, he fell off and, you know, did some dumb teenage kid crap, you know, and, you know, didn't train for a little bit. And then he came back and 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 got with me. And I've been I've been training him since I don't know. He was probably 20. And now mm -hmm. he's about 25. So he's been with me for a while now, his whole kind of pro career. But mm -hmm. the thing about Austin Lingo is you've seen it. He's just cool as a cucumber in there, man. He's just one of those guys. You drop him in that bucket and he's just ready to rock. He's a fighter through and through. And you can't really say that for everybody else. Some, some guys fight, but they're not fighters. You know, they want to test themselves, but they don't like getting hit. Uh, they don't like to go in the pocket. You can see it. Uh, I'll never forget talking to Sean Shelby and he was saying, yeah, this guy, man, he hates getting hit. And, and I never thought of it. And I watched a guy and I was like, man, he is, does hate getting hit. You know, I mean, certain guys, if you really pay attention, their whole stand up game is predicated on please do not hit me. Throwing yeah. a little push kick and, you know, doing all the movement. Austin Lingo ain't that guy. You know, he, I mean, he ain't that guy. He's the guy that loves to go in there and crack, you know, and that's a scary guy, man, when you got that kind of power. So. He's good everywhere, too, you know, but the kid he's fighting is super tough. Yusuf Zalal, good kid. I, I, um, I, I've seen him before, you know, big kid, athletic, comes from a good camp. So it, this is like a contender fight main event in the UFC. Uh, mm, and I, I'm sure. happy for, for both of them because they both got the call, you know, enough fights fell out. And it's just lucky for them. This is like three years ago when there was no contender and they would just get to go straight in because – Otherwise, they'd be fighting each other on the contender and, yeah, and yeah. Uh, even matchup, both super tough. And um, that's going to be an explosive one. So let's talk about Moreno. Moreno is another guy that's been with your team for a while. This is a guy. He's on a three fight winning streak. He was supposed right. to go against Diego Lima. 
uh, you know, the big brother of Bellator champion Douglas Lima, a true veteran of the sport, guys we you know a lot about. Now all of a sudden he gets, you know, late replacement. Kalen Williams, a guy, he's making his UFC debut. We don't know, we don't know that much about him. Obviously, I'm sure you've had to do your studying. Uh, how, how, what, what has been the biggest improvement in Alex's game that, that he's on this three-fight winning streak? And the second one, how do you feel he matches up with Kalen? And the third thing, you said, said, said something, when I think about Alex Moreno, I think about something you said earlier. You said, well, we'll have black belts who want to stand up the whole time. Well, isn't that, uh, Alex Moreno is a black belt. 100%. He loves, he loves Spitting wheel <laughs> kicks, he loves spitting back fist. He, like, he's a psycho. He's my he's my Viking, he's my Viking psycho, Alex Morono. That's what I call him. He's just like he's like a crazy Viking. That guy. He loves battle and blood. And uh, he, there you go. There's a guy, quiet as hell. You know, Star Wars, uh, Star Wars nerd. dude. Yeah. Star Wars nerd. And I tell him all the time. But man, you that guy. He don't care. He loves to fight. So I mean, you can you can show off and put sunglasses on and talk a big game, and act like you're tough, but some of them, there's some of those guys that are super tough, you know, yeah. Tony put sunglasses on, but you know, he's a fighter. He's I mean, it, yeah. I'm not saying if you put sunglasses on, you ain't tough, but there's nerds like Alex Morono that you, he loves to fight. He loves making that walk. And those guys are dangerous, man. And Alex Morono on a three fight win streak. Now we've really worked on getting him, you know, high and tight with his striking. You know, he used to get a little bit loose with his counters and he liked to counter a lot, you know, and he would win fights and like Nico price fight. He, I wasn't coaching him, but he was winning that whole fight. That fight and then yeah. he got caught getting loose. So just getting him really tight with his striking. He's another guy that likes to come forward as you saw in the Max Griffin fight and Max Griffin's super tough. When Alex comes forward and starts cracking, He's a goer. So now he's fighting a kid that's a wrestler and, you know, explosive hands. Uh, first fight in the big show. So I'm sure he's going to, you know, um, be coming forward and, and, and trying to impress. But he's got to yeah. fight that psychopath. So now last one, Miles John is a guy that uh, I watched him a lot coming up. He, you know, coming up the LFA scene, which I think is the best regional promotion yeah, there is. 100%. Uh, 100% right. He, he is. So I do all the previews for sure, dog. Uh, the contender series previews. I do it in depth. I, I take a lot of pride in it. I study all the fighters. I look. I saw. I try, I try to find as much fight film. And Richie Santiago is a guy. He fought a, 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 on on the contender series. Richie Santiago is a local guy. I see him in person. I'm friendly with Richie Santiago. Yeah. But I want to have integrity as a journalist. I think I said in in the piece as nice as possible. This is the biggest mismatch in contender series history. Yeah, but, I, I, and I, I, I don't mean it. I don't but, mean it. As but, an insult. Hit me out, but, hit me out, coach. Hit me, coach. I okay. don't mean it as an insult to Richie Santiago. I know. I'm that high in Miles John. I see a could like a future title yeah. contender. Am I? Am I wrong? Is he? But, but here's what I want to say about Richie Santiago yeah. because this fucking kid got his jaw broken tough in the tough. third round, yeah. and he never stopped. And I think Sean Sean said this kid's tough, man. He's not going to go away. And I think he wanted to see if Miles could deal with it. Miles tore his hip before that fight, and then he fully tore it off the bone in the second round. And uh, that was a tough fight for him. I mean, he dominated. He, points, dom though. he dominated the fight. There's no. You were right. I mean, he dominated the fight. And stylistically, I, I could see it because Richie's a smaller guy too. You think he fought at 25 before he's, too? But he's tall. He's tall though. He's. But man, dude, that dude, like, he's got all my respect. Like, I mean, he is a tough dude. I mean. And he wasn't quitting either. It wasn't like he broke his jaw and he was just like like sure. cowering away. I mean, he was in it to win it. Like it didn't even phase him that his jaw was broken. So I got a ton of respect for that kid. And uh, yeah, you're you know Miles is is great, and I'm hoping he could be a top 15 for us. He's a bantam weight, which is a deadly deadly yeah. weight class. Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, it, killers, just monsters. So we have no illusions, you know, I mean, he's got a long way to go and, you know, he's on a one fight win streak and, you know, hopefully he can make it two and three and, and so on and so forth. But, uh, yeah, so you gotta make sure he, you gotta make sure he doesn't listen to people like me. You, you, you no, can't, no, he, let you me can't have you someone like me being like being the no. cheerleader. Let me tell you something. I have never seen somebody elevate themselves more in one camp than miles has in this camp. Okay. He has, he has elevated his game. Because uh, he's fighting a tough kid uh, okay. Mara, from a tough camp. I know I say that about everybody, but yeah, they yeah. are. And Lab is tough. Uh, Factory X is tough. Rufus Sport yeah. is tough. They're all tough. You know, just because we win, that doesn't mean that, that, that to take away from these guys. I mean, uh, John Crouch always comes up to me and you're, I mean, he's, like, he's such a sweet guy. He's like, you're the man, dude. What are you doing down there? Yeah, yeah. He's like, man, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude. How he's many trying to steal his secrets. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I go, I go. <laughs> 
I go, let's talk when I get a champ, buddy. I go, let's not forget about what you did with Benson, you know, and he just kind of smiles. I said, no, you got the Super Bowl ring, you know what I mean? Like, you got a champ. So, you know, I mean, look, everybody has their time. Every camp has their time. But these guys have been here, man, and they've done it, you know, and you can't forget that. And Mario Batista is a straight monster. Uh, I've seen the kid live. I mean, he is a goer. Good good striker, long range. Yeah, good in the clinch. Very good in the clinch. And again, there's a fighter. He don't give a shit. He's going to come ready to party. And Miles is too. So these are just, you know, we, we take whatever fight, you know, we take every fight. You know, we ne- I never say no to a fight. And if you're going to win the belt, you're going to have to fight everybody anyway. So mm-hmm. why, you know, why lie and waste time? So we, you know, we get right to it. And that, that was a matchup that we liked, but it's a hard matchup. And, uh, and Miles is ready, and I'm sure Mario is too. So, You mentioned uh, you know, you haven't had that champion yet. I don't think you're that far away. I'm sure you have a couple names in your mind. I'm never going to ask you, you know, Coach, who's, who's the person? <laughs> who's the person that's going to be your champion? I'm never going to. I'm not going to make you pick. It would be like me picking between my children, which one will succeed the most as a, an adult. Sure. I would never do that. For so sure. I'm not going to say you pick. But I'll ask you this. How far away do you think you are? I mean, again, I always preach live in the process. You know what I mean? Live in the process. I mean, we, who knows? You know, I mean, Jeff Neal is, I would never want to fight Jeff Neal. I fought welterweight. I look at Jeff Neal. And I mean, I'm down. You know, I mean, I'm a scrappy guy. I'll punch you in the face. I look at Jeff and I'm like, man, dude, this guy, <laughs> you know, I mean, this guy is just, he is that good. You know, Diego Ferrer is on a six fight win streak. I mean, fighting Tysimov, Rustam. Pettis. I mean, these are monsters. Just now I mean, getting his recognition. Yeah, just now got 11. So, yeah. man, it is no game in there. When you get to the top 10, top 12, each one of those divisions, you're talking straight killers in there. So, yeah. uh, you know, but we, you know, I think Uriah Hall has the best hands at 185, really? period. Yeah, I mean, I really do. I don't know anyone that has a jab like Uriah Hall. You even saw that in the Paula Costa fight. Sure. Uriah's got quick, quick hands. So, Uriah, focused Uriah and, and uh, ready Uriah is dangerous, man. And uh, and we got a lot of Macy Chasson is about is is you know she took a little stumble, but she's only six and one. Yeah. I mean six and one. You're not you don't even know what you're doing until you get ten fights. Yeah. You know I mean truly. Sure. So she just had so much success so early on. You know she's going to be the champ. I think she will uh, eventually uh, fulfill that that challenge. So man. I'll just say, look at all the ranked fighters that we have, and mm-hmm. and they're all pushing towards it. And you know who reaches it first? I don't know. And and again, we we got to live in the process, man. If you look at the the people that have the belts in those weight classes, Amanda Nunez, okay, uh, Kamaru Usman, who I know very well, monster, right? Yeah, yeah, killers. Uh, um, uh, Khabib, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, you can't just you you can't, It's just like, when people talk about John. It just gets on my last nerve, you know, oh, you suck and blah, blah, blah. The guy's been the champ since 2011 or 10. I mean, look at the list. He has beat every generation of tough guys that there is and continues to do it, you know, no matter yeah, what happens. I, think, I mean, I think Brock Lesnar was the champion when yeah, he won it. Or something. It's, like, yeah. it's like, dude, man, just shut up. You know, like you yeah. have to give respect to these athletes that have climbed the mountain. So. Look, man, you know, when we get there, we get there and, you know, we want to smash people and we want to take the gold. Absolutely. You know, and uh, that's that's the goal and that's the mission and that's what we're going to do. But you just got to shut up and do it, man. Nobody wants to hear about it. Uh, nobody cares. You know, no one cares about no one cares about any place but first. And that's yeah. the truth. And I don't blame them. So um, I got one question. I, 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 I've already held you longer than I promise. So I want to ask this one question because take your time. Yeah. So. You're the coach. You're super busy. You always have to travel. Like, how do you balance the travel? To, like, what is the schedule like for you during the fight? Like, yeah. you have to tra- – so right now you have to – and it might be a little easier because you're in Dallas and they're in Houston. It might be a little easier than normal. But there's a week you yeah. have to travel from Dallas to, say, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. But then you still yeah. have to be back for the team. It's not like a you know, NFL yeah. team. The whole team's going. Like, Bel- Belichick doesn't have to – coach other guys back you know, you know right. there's not half the team training for the next week you know the whole team's training together how do you balance like, what what is your schedule like how do you do it <laughs> i mean it's so crazy that it's so weird how things work out you know you get life prepares you for these moments that you don't realize but 
you know, when I, in 2011, I think we went 40 and five, all smaller shows, you know, uh, I think some legacy wins, but we were, it was a small, but 45 fights, you know, 40 and five. And we had all these, had all these guys and all these little cards here and there. And, uh, all those years of grinding, you know, I've been coaching since 2009 full time and all those years of grinding just kind of got me ready. And I've learned, you know, how to be efficient. And, you know, I try to, I try to leave as late as I can during the week and and get there be there for my athletes fight week but also make sure that i'm getting the athletes that are here prepared for their bouts that are coming up you know the week after that and the week after that you know you hit on it and we've gotten pretty good at it and we have such a big team now with so many assets i feel like uh we've got it down to to a science and um and and the fighters too are so focused on their jobs that uh even when i'm gone i mean they're, they're getting the work done. You know, I've got a great wrestling coach in David Bertolino who, who's there for me, you know, on Thursdays when I'm, when I have to leave for the UFC and we've got awesome jujitsu coaches and Laurence Marion and Josh Bagalay, our strength coach, Mike Skasha. I mean, this guy is, I think the best in the world. I mean, he just okay. tortures these guys and he's a huge reason for the success. All these guys aren't getting tired in there, yeah. you know? So look, I mean, I can go on and on, but it is crazy, you know? And, uh, uh, it, it, as at, at 39, when you leave your kids, you know, it's not, it, it ain't playtime, you know, traveling all over the place and not seeing your kids and missing birthdays and the daddy daughter dance, I think is this week. And, oh. and my, my youngest man, she, I took my oldest in a limo last year cause I was home oh. and I took her in a limo and we rode up there, you know, and yeah. uh, it was fun. And, and my little one, she said, you better do this for me next year. Oh, no. And I said, I got you, baby. Like, don't worry about it. And man, I had to tell her and boy, she rode me and rode me. So oh. I went to, I went to her school today and had lunch with her and I'm trying to preload it because, you know, you it, it's, it, it's just one of those things, but Hey man, everybody has challenges. You know, everyone has sure. a job that has ups and downs and I do what I love. And when you yeah. do what you love, you know, you'll, 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 you'll stay on that wrestling mat with those kids four hours, five hours. Yeah. And like, Damn, right. what am I doing? And I, I don't even know if you're getting paid. You're doing yeah. it out of the love of the game and the love of the sport. And that's what it's about, man. And life isn't always about money. You know, and money, money comes when, you know, you do the right thing. I really believe that, you know, and uh, I'm big on preaching on finances as well. You know, I never, ever wanted to be one of those broke down uh, old martial artists, you know. Oh, yeah, you sure. should be. Uh, no, you know, this is pro sports, man. And, and uh, you know, make your money and, and, and save your money and, um uh, and do all the things that you dreamed of doing. So I try not to complain about it, but it's definitely wild and, and having three guys on and running to the back and running back out and running to the back and running back, switching shirts. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't think about that. Yeah. You got to yeah. take off the one. Yeah, that's you don't want to go out there with that Austin lingo shirt, you know, and Alex Morono and yeah. Yeah, DC, DC and then making fun of me. So yeah, uh, <laughs> look, man, it's, it is what it is and you just got to enjoy it. And this is what we've been working for for all these years. And, just feel blessed and fortunate and you know all this all this stuff sounds cliche man but it's just all the truth and sometimes you you just have to appreciate where you're at and no matter what these are the opportunities that that we always you know dreamed of and wanted so i'm there for these kids man and the last thing i'll say is this is their week you know i torture these kids keith i mean uh just like you tortured that heavyweight yeah i torture these kids and they put in the work. So fight week, I try to just make it about them. I'm there. You need anything. I mean, I hold the phone and like, I video their weigh-ins and stuff. And like, yeah. Man, coach, they're like, coach, you don't got to do it. My wife's like, put that phone down. It just doesn't even suit you standing there, you know, <laughs> filming people, yeah, yeah. you know. And I'm like, look, it's not about me. You know, I, I film their walkout after they win because the crowd. And then I yeah. send, I airdrop them all that stuff. So they have a kind of a memory of fight week, you know. Cool. Of, yeah, it's cool. Like it's a little video library and I do it quietly because I don't want it. I don't want them being distracted. And, you know, I'm kind of big on like stay off Instagram and like if you're on Instagram, you know, uh, uh, Diego does this. He's like on my way to the show. And I'm like, Carlos, man, get off your phone. But yeah. it's his process. Like he's yeah. on the bus. I, I, I'm kind of old school as far as like you got to get in the zone. So yeah, did that kill? I want to ready to kill somebody. You yeah. That. Yeah. I mean, but but. Again, uh, that's how he stays relaxed, and you can't hey. argue with the results, right? So everyone has a process fight week, and I try to kind of just support that. Yeah. And the, the work, the work is done, man. The work is done. And I'm sure the way you talk to each fighter, I must be like, I'm sure there's some ones you've got to 
you know, I, I've seen Absolutely. you do it. You're in the corner and you're you're getting, you know, what do you what do you work for? Dig deep. You get that Absolutely. Hoo-rah, yelling at him, screaming at him. And then the other ones, you might someone yep. that might work for yep. fill in the blank. And then another fighter, you might you can't yell at them. You got to right. build them up. They're built. Their their confidence is so, losing. You have to build. Hey, you're one of the best in the world. You you're can so, do yeah, you're totally right. And I think that that's the real trick to a great coach. You Learning. Know, if, I don't, if, I, if I don't hear a coach in the corner, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, when I hear, see, watch coaches just be absolutely silent, not say anything, it's like, what are you doing there? You know, I mean, that's your job. So are, are you freezing up? Is your brain not working quick enough? Are you not seeing the greens for what they are? Like, is your fighter just that good and you just kind of got lucky? You know, I mean, I mean, I'm just being honest. Like, uh, that's your job is to try to give them as much information as you can. And I always tell them, I don't care what I look like, you know. I always say everyone – I got a lot of viral videos and a lot of love for some of my my uh, my cornering moments where I'm you know getting yeah. people's ass. But uh, uh, here's the thing. I always tell them, you making me yell, that's not what I want, right? Yeah. I'll do whatever it takes to win. If I think I need to yell at you at that moment, I'll yell. If I think I need to whisper at you, I'll whisper. Whatever it takes, I, I don't care. I mean, again, it's not about me. They put all that work in, in the camp, Keith. They want it so bad, and sometimes the, the, the bright lights hit them. You know, and stuff doesn't go right. So you just got to do everything you can to try to get them that W. And it's not about you, man. Whatever sure. it takes, whatever it takes. There, there, there's a, obviously there's a lot of psychological. I remember coaching, and again, I don't want to co- compare myself to you, but I remember coaching wrestling and seeing two kids dying. And I remember 100%. saying to the kid, the other kid wanted out. And I said to the kid, you press it right now. That kid wants out. He's uh-huh. ready to quit. And I was saying it loud enough. So the other kid could hear it. So I could crumble that kid i said you're not even tired this kid's dying yeah. he's dying he's looking for a way out what and, happened and i was trying to psych and my guy won yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't won. tell i wouldn't never tell a story of my guy loses That's <laughs> <Yeah. no fun. laughs> but but it happens though sometimes. oh well, of course it does well, yeah. but what, what i was gonna say is like that kid will always have that moment right like he'll yeah. always have that win he'll always have that oh man when i was a junior you know i was a badass or whatever like it's yeah. worth it man if the kid yeah. has put in the toil and put in the work and put in the grind in the gym you know, sell out, man. I come home like sometimes I have no voice, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, my favorite thing to do after my guys win uh, most of the time, hopefully, God willing, is yeah. uh, go to their Instagram and see all the comments and like, oh, man, you're the man or like the family. Like, you know, we're so proud of you. And and uh, the friends like, man, we all saw you like the friends in high school. This is blah, blah, blah from whatever yeah. middle school. And that's what it's about, man. That's what this whole thing's about. So, uh for me, I get tons of joy out of that. You know, I, I realized that, you know, I got injured and, and hurt and, and, and durability wasn't my thing. But, you know, when I first got hurt, I was like, man, I miss fighting. I want to do it. I can still do it, blah, blah, blah. But now as I've gotten older, you know, I don't even get a joy of if I train and, and I do really well. I don't get that same kind of response where I, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm the man. I just don't, I, don't, I feel nothing. It's just kind of a nothing. Whereas in, if I see one of my kids do well, I feel great. Like yeah. I'm like, it gives me a response, like a like a physical and emotional response. So yeah. that's how you know where you're at, you know. And uh, you know, it's cliche again. You know, give to others, build others up. But I think that's where you're supposed to be in, in sure. your late 30s. And if you're not, then you're just a weirdo, dude. Grow yeah. up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's right. Grow that's up. Right. You know, you're 40 years old, dude. Go, go home and and read a book and and do some crunches. You know, like <laughs> you got to grow up, man. So yeah. I, I, I'm proud of them, and I'm also happy uh, to see them, you know, succeed. And uh, we're just gonna keep pushing. Yeah, uh, I, I think about you were talking about uh, friends reaching out to these fighters. There'll be one day, 65 years old, uh, Macy. Yeah. Think about yeah. the time of her life when she beat yeah, so yeah. and so, when she had coach yeah. saw you selling at her. Um, like I said, I kept you way too long. I got two last questions. No That'd worries. Take quick. your time. That'll be real quick. So we know all the big names. Give us that one fighter that hasn't reached the UFC yet that we should all be watching in 2020. I think R- Ramez Brahima is. Okay, uh, yeah. I think that kid, he just won worlds and, and uh, he doesn't even do jujitsu class. Yeah. And he went he went to worlds. He's like, coach, you know, he had that eye surgery and stuff. And yeah. and he was the main event. He was supposed to fight the contender. And I think, you know, he was going to yeah, go really. against Baiza, who's real tough. But I, I think it was, you know, I think he would have done well. And, and uh, it was unfortunate he had to have that surgery. So he's back. He's he's healthy and he's ready. And but as far as worlds go, he said, I, you know, I just want to have something to do. And, and we didn't have a fight schedule. So I said, all right, you know, don't get hurt. Go do worlds. So he goes and does worlds as a blue belt and uh, submits 
everybody and doesn't get one point scored against them and yeah. wins the world championship. You know, I mean, like, I mean, well, yeah, Dan Gable type stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know how <laughs> good these guys are that are trained. There's a lot of tough BJJ jiu-jitsu guys Close. out there that that are yeah. stacked up, yoked up, you know, uh, juiced up, training, yeah. ready, you know. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, I was like, man, it just shows you his level on the ground. I mean, he is a monster. And he's good on the feet, too. He's he's paid his dues, man. And he uh, hopefully he gets his time to shine in 2020. And, and you know, Miles' little brother is a monster, too. EJ, Elijah yeah, Johns. Yeah. yeah. Um, bigger. He's, he's, he's yeah. little or by age, but bigger. Right? Yeah, he's he's bigger. Yeah. He's he's a monster, too. Yeah, and there's there's a bunch more, but they got to earn it. They'll no, earn I, it. I, yeah. <laughs> I know you have a busy time. You're going to be going crazy it's not gonna be like me sitting on the couch uh you know with my feet up i mean i'll be typing i do my typing but still, <laughs> uh but i gotta ask you because you know everyone wants to know you mentioned his name many times main event john jones give me your prediction jones. how the, the main event fight goes on and and i mean are you are you watching like are you are you guys still too busy or uh, at that point yeah. you, know, you know we all go to the green room afterwards and, yeah. and we all eat like that's the number one priority because we've been there all day and it's kind of it's like the fraternity of ufc like you everybody on the card is back there you know I, sometimes i go out to the floor you know i'll get a floor ticket and go out there with some friends or whatever but most of the time i just sit in the back and I'll, to be honest with you a lot of time we leave like <laughs> if we win and it, everybody's all good and happy we'll go back and I'll go to bed. You know, I mean, yeah. I'll, I've left, I'll, I've left probably more than I've stayed. Uh, sometimes I stay and, you know, we're in Texas. So I'll, I don't know. I'll probably stay, but here's the thing. It goes back to what we're saying about John. Like you can talk all you want, man, but you, if you don't respect where he's at and, and, and give him, you know, his due, you're just being foolish. And Dom Reyes is really tough. He's athletic. He is big. He's probably the only other guy that's the same size as John besides Gustafson. And also, uh, St. Prue gave him a hard time, too, just kind of because of the size. You know, it does matter against John. Mm -hmm. Tiago Santos, too, you know, another big guy. So I'm not saying it doesn't matter. But I do think that uh, I think John is focused. And I think that he's irritated a little bit, you know, okay. uh, yeah. with, uh, you know, Dom Reyes kind of talking to him and disrespecting him a little. And. I think a focus John is a dangerous John, uh, kind of like Connor. And uh, again, you have to give that level credence. And the Ozdemir fight was not a good fight for Dom Reyes. And if you look at the MMA math, doesn't work. But if you look at the Ozdemir fight and take, you know, some tidbits from it, man, you know, John can take you down and ground and pound the hell out of you. You know, what I mean, he has got, he, he's good in the clinch. He's good in all these spaces. Can Dom Reyes land that left? Yeah, sure. But man, John's got so many other tools. You know, yeah. I got to I got to give the nod to John. And I mean, he could stop him. I mean, he could not. I mean, I, I try not to predict with other fights, you know, how it's going to go exactly. But I'm definitely tails him towards John 100 percent. There you have it. Uh, I want to thank uh, Coach Sa Safe Saoud. He's the head coach of Fortis MMA. Uh, he's got a very busy night. Uh, make sure you stick around for the third segment where I'm actually going to be with all my predictions for the entire card, including the three fighters from Florida MMA. I'm not going to tell the coach how I'm going to pick those fights, uh, <laughs> but just stick around. Uh, he'll have he'll have to listen later, and he, and and he'll have, and, you know when this airs, he can he can listen. But coach, good luck to you and all three of your fighters. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it, and and thanks for having me on and uh, and support. And we uh, we watch all that stuff, and we appreciate it. And I know you're neutral, but you know if it wasn't for you guys pointing out where we're at, you know, and giving us the love that, that we have. It's not easy for a new team to break out and get the respect and you've got all the old teams. So it's guys like you that that help us do that and we appreciate it. Well you deserve it. Uh guys just we're gonna take a short break and we'll be back with all my predictions. Thanks a lot. We are back. Give me a takeover with Keith Schilling. I am Cross Keith Schilling. Before we close up the show, I just want to thank Coach Safe Sayud, 47 May, uh, for the time. He gave me way more time than he promised to. He's got a very busy week. So wish him and all his fighters good luck. Uh, but I promised I'd give my predictions for all 12 fights. I'm not going to go as in depth as I normally do. Of course, we have the breakdown show, who does a good job. But also, I gave my predictions on the fights. Um, I did it for Sure Dog Roundtable. I was a guest on this week, hosted by Jack and Canarcion. 
and also Ant Walker and Luca Fury, two really, really knowledgeable guys in the sport, also gave their predictions. So you can get my some of my predictions there. And also I did that in-depth breakdown on all angles with John Franklin for the main event. So I'm going to try to buzz through these as quick as I can. So let's start off with Fortis MMA. We have Austin Lingo making his UFC debut. He's going against uh, another debut, debutant, I should say, Yusef Zalil. Uh, this fight seems like it could be a contender series matchup as both guys, uh, you know, or, or, or an LFA main event. Like I don't know if it, it, it was kind of got put in due to cancellations. I know um, – St. Pru and Spawn got canceled. Jimmy Rivera and Marlon Vera, uh, Jimmy Rivera and Marlon Vera uh, got canceled. So they luckily for these guys, they got in. I'm going to take Austin Lingo. This guy, they call him lights out. He's 6-0. and He's got three knockouts all in the first round. Oh, actually, I think, what did I say 6 I think he might be not. I'm sorry, he's 7-0. Uh, his last three wins uh, were knockouts. In the first round, they actually combined for 63 seconds. Dazil is a, a long, lengthy guy, but he actually lost two of his last three fights. He got in due to his flying knee knock on his last fight. But um, even though he's long and lengthy, he's a guy that really wants to get to the fight to the ground where he actually uses his long limbs to get a submission. I don't think that happens. I see Lingo as a legit prospect. I think uh, Zalil, though he's only 23 years old, he's a lot of growth. I don't think he's ready for the UFC. So give me... Uh, lingo. Next fight, Andre Ewell versus Jonathan Martinez. This is definitely going to be a striking battle as both guys have showed weakness on the ground. Um, and But on the feet, neither guy is really known for their power. Um, I think Ewell it might be the little quicker guy. He's definitely the longer guy. I like how um, I like how loose he gets. He stays very loose. With, it doesn't really tense up. Um, and he's pretty accurate. I'm going to go with him to pick apart Martinez from range, but that, that should be a really fun fight. Uh, give me Ewell by decision. Uh, oh, I don't know if I gave what I said. I'm going to take Lingo in the first round in the knockout. Uh, moving on, Domingo Polarte, a guy that is known for cutting a lot of weight back down to one. I mean, he's at 135 going against Jordan Newsom. Newsom was a guy that I was really impressed with him in his in his fight against Ricardo Hamas. Uh, he showed extreme toughness. Even though Hamas hit him with everything, he kept going forward. And he actually almost had a guillotine choke on Hamas. Uh, Polarte is a guy that when I did the contender series, uh, previews, I was not that high on, he's a long rangey guy. He's very aggressive, uh, kind of brawls a little bit. Um, and he, and he does have good rest, uh, takedowns, but I don't know if he has really good takedown defense. Um, I'm going to go with Jeremy Newsom. I mean, he did very well against a guy that we're kind of almost, he's, he's a good fighter. Um, I see Jeremy Newsom. I don't know if he's going to get a stoppage, but I think he can get a decision. So that closes up the fight pass portion in the – or I think it's, you could also view it on ESPN+. Plus. Moving on to the ESPN prelims, uh, the second Fortis MMA guy, Miles Johns, a guy that I've been very high on. We, we talked about – already we talked about that with Coach Safe Sayud in the last segment. He's going against Mario Batista. Batista's going to want to keep this fight on his feet. He's a long, lengthy guy. Um, he actually is pretty good in the clinch where he, he, he uses his knees and elbows. And he has really um, – he really looks for the flying knee or like a step in knee. That's actually how he won his last fight. Uh, Johns is just like your classic rec- wrestle boxer, uh, good jab, or he uses the jab to get in the pocket where he fires off big power shots. But also the is you know he's known for his wrestling. That's his bread and butter. He's got really good fast entries, good good exchanges, and he has that uh, guillotine barbell choke that he really looks for. Uh, I expect Johns to win this fairly easy. I look, when I last looked at the line, Johns wasn't even that big a favorite. I think he was like negative. He is the favorite, but he was negative 130. Um, I think Johns runs right through Mario Batista. I, I you know, I'm going to say he, no, I'm not going to say he gets a stop. I'm saying he wins a pretty dominant unanimous decision. Um, Moving on, the the last fight for Fortis MMA, Alex Morano versus Kylan Williams, Chaos Williams. I didn't really know much about Kylan Williams, uh, but I did do some tape study on him, and he just does not look like he's ready for the UFC. He's kind of uh, uh, he's a, I would say he's well rounded, but in the sense like for the regional scene, he's. He's big, he's strong, he's physically imposing, but he's got a lot of technical flaws. He throws a lot of leg kicks, but they're naked leg kicks. He drops his hands. He's kind of flat-footed. 
stands straight up, lacks head movement. And Alex Morano, while of the three guys fighting for Fortis MMA, I view him as the least promising as he's been around for a while. And he kind of, he's on a roll. I think he's won his last, let me pull this up real quick. I'm sorry. I sure already have this up. He won his last three fights. I think that was all. Uh, yes, he won his last three fights. I think that's all since joining Fortis MMA. So that has actually helped him out greatly. He's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, so he hits the ground. He could get a submission. But this is a guy who wants to brawl. And due to the lack of head movement of Kalen Williams, kind of flat foot, I think Morano's going to take hit him, hit him with a big shot and put him out, possibly that overhand right or his left hook, which is two, his two best punches. Give me Morano. I'm actually going to take him. Uh, you know, I'm going to go first round. I'm going to say he takes, I takes, takes care of Williams. First round knockout. So I, so my prediction on the day is Fortis MMA going 3-0. and oh, um, And a uh, really good day for Coach Safe Sayud. I know people think of like, oh, yeah, you just interviewed him. Of course you're going to pick him 3-0. Yeah, you're not going to believe me, but I'm not scared to make a prediction. And if I thought one of the guys was going to lose, I would have picked it. Um, a fight that uh, has a lot of meaning. Uh, is next the, the women's flyweight division matchup between Andrew Lee and uh, her opponent, Lauren Murphy. Uh, the winner of this fight can really move up the ranks and they're not that far from a title shot. That said, I'm not that interested in this fight. Uh, Mur- Murphy's a, guy, a girl that I, I've never really been that big into. She, she looked at her last fight, uh, but she's a bit of a grinder. Um, I don't know. I never see anything like really jump off the page and press with Andrew Lee, um, kind of little inconsistent. This time she looks great on the feet. Uh, very underrated uh, uh, ground game. She's not a guy like she lacks. She doesn't really have any power. Uh, not that many females have power, but she's a younger fighter. She still has the area to grow. She's like 30 years old. Well, Murphy is 36. Uh, I'm going to go with Andrew Lee to kind of pick up part. Lauren Murphy by range, but I looked at the betting lines and Lauren Murphy's plus 275 underdog right now. I think that line could be a lot closer. They have Andrew Lee a negative 305 favorite. I think that should be like negative 135. <laughs> like I think the lines are way off now. So if you're someone who just looks for value, I think Lauren Murphy could be someone to put, put place a bet on. Not that I'm not a big gambler when it comes to money. Uh, I don't. I mean, I don't like to gamble. It's just, uh, it's not my thing. But if you are, that's something you want to look at. Uh, next fight is Antonio Arroyo versus Trevin Giles. As we're recording it, there's rumors that Antonio Arroyo, who was the last person to weigh in, may be out of the fight, going to the hospital. That so I'm not going to spend too much time because uh, there's a couple of between us, so that fight might be canceled. Uh, I'm going to take Trevin Giles. Uh, Trevor Jones has looked really good at times and really bad. His last two fights in bed. I know a lot of people question how committed he is to MMA being a full-time police officer. And that always bothers me because it's not like he's doing that. Like he could be a full-time fighter. I mean, if he could be a full-time fighter, he could make money. He maybe will, but a lot of times it's out of necessity. Uh, that says uh, Roy was a guy that I was not really that big on. A um, bit of a brawler. Uh, he's going to come out swinging hard. I think Giles is more technical on the feet. Could pick him apart from that. And uh, Arroyo has a very bad gas tank. And <laughs> if he's had weight cut issues and this fight is on, it, it would be even worse for him. So, yeah, give me uh, Trevin Giles. Moving on to the main card, Elila TV versus Derek Lewis. This is like one of those really weird matches with the TV, an undersized light heavyweight moving up to heavyweight. Really doesn't make a lot of sense. But you know what? He probably couldn't make middleweight, even though some people say it. You know, he was kind of stuck in the mud at light heavyweight. You know, go up to heavyweight. You don't have to weight cut issues. You know, maybe you can get, you're going to be faster at the division. You might add some power. Um, he's a guy that likes to wrestle, catch. He especially gets his take on catching kicks. Uh, I have a hard time imagining being able to keep Derek Lewis down, be, being that he's going to be giving up so much size. He's probably going to be giving up 30, 35 pounds, maybe more come fight night. Uh, Derek Lewis... You know, he, he's just a power guy. He's a guy who has a lot of power. But in his last fight against uh, Ivanov, he looked a little different. He looked a little trimmer, a little, a little quicker. So um, the speed advantage for Latifi might not be as glaring as we think if we've seen a new, improved Derek Lewis. Um, 
he's going to have to try to keep this fight in the feet. I expect Latifi going to probably look for a takedown. Uh, but give me the Black Beast just for the size advantage, this power advantage. And and it's funny because a lot of people talk about the bad cardio from Derek Lewis. I do think he either slows down or has to pace himself where he can't put a lot of output out. But this guy has incredible heart. So even when he's tired, he's one of these guys who could fight through when he's tired. And I don't think it affects him as much as we've seen other fighters. So give me Derek Lewis. Um, I'd say he gets it done. I think he puts him out too, like third round. Uh, my favorite fight of the night, Mercer Bechtig versus Dan Ige. Uh, to me, this is like the master um, overachiever versus master underachiever. As Bechtig is the guy that we at one time I thought he could be challenging for a UFC title, uh, but unfortunately his chin kind of fails him. He, you know, he was hurt by a jab from Josh Emmett. Uh, obviously, he was knocked out by Darren Elkins in a fight that he was destroying. Uh, Elkins, he's got some nice power in his hands. Nice, uh, he loves to work the body. Good take. That's very strong wrestling. Good at grappling. Good, willing to grind against the fence. Uh, he's shown a lot of things. He's a better athlete than DNA guy, but Ike is a guy. He tr- seems to get everything out of him. And I was impressed with his stand up against Kevin Aguilar in his last fight. Aguilar was a guy that most people would have thought would have the advantage against Danny Ige, but Ige held his own. He hurt Kevin Aguilar in the beginning of the fight. And don't forget, Ige is a Brazilian just black belt. He has good entries, uh, good cop control. He's really he, he stays busy. He's not a guy that um, gets stuck in the bottom. He'll scramble. So I expect this fight to be really fun. When I look at the film, I can see a lot of ways for Ige to win. He's a guy that He's going to make it a tough fight, but I just keep thinking about how high I used to be on Mercer Beckley. Should I be getting off of him already? Uh, no, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to quit on Beckley yet, but if he loses this fight, that might be it for me, me believing in him. But I'll take Beckley. I'm going to take him in a very close. I will split decision. Uh, the fight that everyone's questioned why it's on the main card, Juan Adams versus Justin Taffa. Uh, I mean, Juan, it, it's probably because of, they're hoping for a stoppage, possibly a knockout. And also the fact that Juan Adams, you know, he trains in Jackson MMA and Albuquerque, but he's actually from Houston originally. He's a Texas guy. I don't know if he's from Houston, but he's at least a Texas guy. Uh, you know, that might be a reason. This is to me a class. Neither guys are that good, but this is your classic striker versus grappler. Uh, Adams comes from a wrestling background. He's got good takedowns from the body lock. A good snap down, and he's a massive dude. If he gets on top of you, you're gonna have a hard time getting him off due to how big he was. That said, he got absolutely smoked in his last fight against Greg Hardy. Um, he shot him for a takedown. Greg Hardy like hip tossed him, which was really, really surprising. Then hit those hammer fists, and Juan Adams just held onto his leg, didn't do anything. It was not the not a very good showing from Juan Adams, who especially was talking junk about Greg Hardy, was wanted that fight for a long time, and then disappointed. Uh tough up. I don't know that much more. Obviously, I started his fight against uh, Jorgen De Castro, and I, I watched some of his regional scenes. He's a sl- he's got fast hands. He hits hard. Uh, he does some good work from the uh, from the clinch where he kind of, he does some dirty boxing, but he's got a lot of defensive flaws. Doesn't really move his head. Uh, kind of does that Tito defense where he hides behind his forearms to cut cover up. I, I've never really liked that. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't see anything from him on the ground, so I'm assuming that Juan Adams will have a big advantage in the grappling. I'll take Juan Adams in his hometown. I'm, I think he's going to take down Taffa, move him out, get, get, slug him out with some shots, some ground, heavy ground and pound. I'll take Juan Adams first round. Moving on to the co-main event, a fight that not many people are excited about, Valentina Shevchenko versus Caitlin Chikagin. Not many people are giving Caitlin Chikagin a shot. Uh, I'll tell you how Caitlin Chikagin win. Uh, Caitlin Chikagin is the, what I call the, like a master of air punching. What I mean by that is she'll stay out of range and throw punches in the space between the two fighters. And she'll throw it a lot with a lot of volume and kind of in a way to try to trick the judges that things are happening. Holly Holm is someone who also is very good at this. Uh, but if Holly Holm wasn't able to use a strategy against Valentina Shevchenko, I don't believe that Caitlin Chikagin would do the difference in that fight. Um, with Holly Holm is Valentin and Shevchenko just turned up the volume and, and forced Holly Holm to be fighting off her back foot where she couldn't really fire into that middle space and throw those kicks. Caitlin Shkagan is someone who likes to throw kicks a lot. Uh, uh, Holm is one of those. 
you want a young Jake Shake, one of those has similar styles where they want to throw a lot. Bell Tim Sheena just swarmed that th- countered with hard shots every time they went to throw a strike. I, s- I expect the same here. Uh, Shevchenko, I'm going to take her to pick apart Caitlin Chikagian over five rounds. I think it does go to the decision because Chikagian has never been stopped. I'll take Valentina Shevchenko. I'm going to go 50 44 score. I see she sweeps it and gets at least 110 Main event, Dominic Reyes versus John Joe's. Uh, to kill the Spence, I'm going to take John Jones. That said, I think the line should be a lot closer. I would not be shocked if Don McRae's wins. I know that seems like I'm hedging my bets. Don McRae's has, like we already talked about in the first segment, I'm not going to do it again. He has speed, explosion. Uh, he's a guy that at his age, he can make in huge improvements. Uh, his his step back uppercut is serious. His, his high kicks, his, his left hand is deadly. If he can land a shot against John Jones, who kind of, if we're being honest, just pulls his head back to to avoid strikes. If he could, if he could time something, he could put John Jones out. Um, so I wouldn't be shocked. I don't know what the what the lines are on Dominic Reyes by knockout, but if you're one of these guys who wants a value play and you're willing to lose to take a chance, yeah, Reyes by knockout. I mean, Jones has a grand chance. We've never really even seen him hurt. Tiago Santos landed some good shots. Let me just walk through. But, you know, he is 32 now. It's going to be turned 33. Uh, everyone has to lose at one time. So this could be the chance. I think Reyes is a real threat. The people who are not given a chance, I, I think that's a bad idea. Um, that said, John Jones is the master. I, I'm not even going to break down John Jones. If you want to, I did the whole thing on all angles, really break it down. In fact, I'm kind of this is my third time making predictions. I'm just kind of sick of it. I'd rather fight just to get here by now. Uh, but the, the biggest thing for me was, Reyes was taken down against his last fight against Wyman. He was taken down in the fight before that against uh, Volkan Usman. The fight before that against Ovid St. Pierre. I think two fights before that, Jeremy Kimball took him down. So I think Jones could could get a takedown probably from the clinch and maybe catching a leg too. That's something Jones did do. He did it against Gustin. He liked, to, he liked to catch a leg and get a takedown. I can see Jones taking him down. But the most disturbing thing that Reyes did, and it was against the Usman fight, is that he – when he got taken down, he was willing to give up his back to get up to his feet. And I think that would be a disaster against John Jones. I think John Jones will flatten him out, either land some ground upon or, or, or hit him with some shots. So I think he makes a mistake and Jones makes a pay. I'm going to take John Jones by third round knockout. Now those are all my picks for UFC 247. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Keith Schillen MMA. My last name is spelled S-H-I-L-L-A-N. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy the fights. We'll be back next week. I don't have any guest lines up yet, but uh, I'll make sure I do. And uh, before we close out, again, I want to thank Coach Say Sayu of 47 MMA for coming on. And I want to thank you guys listeners for listening. Hope you guys enjoy the fights. Have a good night.